You're listening to the Standard Podcast, eye-opening for your ears. สวัสดีค่ะโบสาวิตรีนะคะ This is We Need to Talk Podcast, Podcast Talk Show ภาษาอังกฤษสำหรับคนไทยที่ใช้ภาษาอังกฤษค่ะ Hi, you guys. Welcome to our show, and thank you so much for listening. ตามธรรมเนียมของ We Need to Talk, โบจะชวนแกสของเราคุยกัน3ประเด็นนะคะถ้าเกิดว่าเป็นพี่นัทเนี่ยโบว่าเรื่องที่ต้องชวนคุยอย่างแรงพลาดไม่ได้เรื่องแรกเลยนะคะก็คือชีวิตใน Harvard หนึ่งในมหาวิทยาลัยที่โด่งดังที่สุดในโลกค่ะอยากรู้มากๆเลยค่ะว่าจะมีแต่เนิร์ดเนิร์ดหรือเปล่าเดี๋ยวมาฟังกันค่ะ 2. คุณผู้ฟังได้ติดตาม IG พี่นัทไหมคะอืมแซบเวอร์คือโบกก็ไม่แน่ใจนะคะว่ามันคือซิกแพคหรือว่ามากกว่านั้นอาจจะแบบนับไปนับมาอาจจะสัก8หรือ10แพคก็ได้นะคะศิลปินหนุ่มคนนี้ดูแลตัวเองยังไงเดี๋ยวโบจะถามให้นะคะและ 3. เราต้องคุยกันเรื่องแฟนคลับของพี่นัทค่ะทำไมนะหรอคะจะบอกว่าโบเจอมาด้วยตัวเองค่ะแฟนคลับพี่นัทนี่นะคะอาหารการกินสมบูรณ์มากอร่อยอร่อยทั้งนั้นค่ะตัวโบแล้วก็พี่ๆน้องๆใน AF นะคะก็จะได้อนิสงส์ไปด้วยตลอดเลยค่ะคือพวกเขาน่ารักกันมากจริงๆค่ะแล้วก็ติดตามพี่นัทด้วยความรักและความจริงใจจริงๆนะคะเดี๋ยวรอฟังพี่นัทเล่าให้ฟังเองดีกว่าค่ะเอาละค่ะตอนนี้ได้เวลาเปลี่ยนโหมดเป็นภาษาอังกฤษกันแล้วพร้อมหรือยังคะ Ladies and gentlemen, it would be my pleasure to introduce our guest for the premiere episode of We Need to Talk podcast. He is the winner of AF4, a singer, an actor, a model, and honestly, one of the most charming and intelligent guys I have ever known. Pete n a t s a k d a t o n ka. Hello, Pinat. Hi, Nongbo. Welcome to our show, <laughs> to our first episode ever. You know, this is my first podcast ever. Also, really, yeah, I'm excited and nervous. <laughs> We're so honored! Yay. Yay! So thank you for being here. No, my pleasure. Really. Of course, you know, I'm sure you you're used to being interviewed about your ex your college experience. I'm mm-hmm. sure you can't avoid it. I'm sure whatever, whatever interview you go to, whatever TV show you go on. Uh-huh. They'll talk about it, and it's good. I want to talk about it. Yeah, and personally, <laughs> I want to know about it. I'm sure our listeners want to hear about it uh-huh. too. You know, with your experience at Harvard, uh-huh. my question to you, I've always wanted to know: Was Harvard your first choice, or was it something that just just happened to um, fall in your lap? You know, actually, I had to go back a little bit before before I went to the U.S. Mm-hmm. for high school. I never heard of Harvard. <laughs> What? Yeah, I never heard of Harvard. But you I were really like young. I was just like Chiang Mai kid studying at um, the school called Mong Fort mm-hmm. College, and um, just just a regular kid. Yeah. And then what happened was that you know my cousin went for a summer school in um, I think it was England, mm-hmm. and then he came back with like really long hair, and he looked really handsome. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like compared to me, I was in like an all boy school that had. Like we had a rule that our hair couldn't be longer than like two centimeters, yeah. centimeters or something like that. So I was like, I saw my cousin with long hair, and I was like, Oh my god, I want to look like that. <laughs> so I, that's when it started. That's when it started. I, I was so jealous of his hair. <laughs> I wanted to be like more handsome, so. I asked my parents if I could go to the U.S. Yeah, t h a s my so you can have long hair. That, yeah, that's <laughs> that's my hidden reason. I didn't tell them that. Of yeah, course. of course. I, I just said I said like, oh, I wanted to improve my English or whatever, and then yeah. So I went there for high school. I, I did all my studying, mm-hmm. and then the name Harvard just kind of you know like came along in I think 1 1 t h grade mm-hmm. when people started you know thinking about college. Yeah, and I was like, okay, so where should I go? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so I, I started. Looking at all these places, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, of course, I, I look at the the Ivy League schools and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm. What other schools did you apply to? I applied to um, Harvard, Brown, uh, Columbia, U Penn, and Stanford. Mm. And I got into um, Harvard, Brown, and Columbia. I didn't get into the other two. Actually, I wanted to go to Stanford. Yeah, because like I my high school was in New Jersey, so I was like. 
I wanted to change the atmosphere. You know, I wanted to be on the west side, yeah, on the west side, <laughs> where the weather is better, yeah, <laughs> everything like that. But I didn't get accepted to Stanford, so I, I I went to Harvard instead. So Harvard wasn't really your first choice. It wasn't, but in the end, I think things always happen the way they're supposed to happen. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? In the end, I I really I was really glad that I didn't get accepted to Stanford because in the end, I really appreciated my experience at uh, at Harvard. Yeah. And, yeah, a lot of people would kill to be at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> so here you are. You're like, yeah, you know, Harvard wasn't really my first choice, but <laughs> um, before going to Harvard. Uh huh. Did you he- like what have you heard about it, and was it everything that you expected it to be? I mean, I think it's. I just had like a bit of like a wrong perception that mm-hmm. I think a lot of people would have had that like you know Harvard kid would be like snobbish and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But actually, when I went there, it, it was completely different. People were really nice and friendly, and I think that the good, the really good thing about the community there is that. It was so diverse. You know, mm-hmm. people came from all over the world. Um, you had people with interests, backgrounds in like music, sport, whatever you can name it. It, it was yeah. just like, yeah, it, whatever you like. All these people from like the top leagues of what they were doing. Yeah, you know what I mean, you, it was you just pretty, so interesting. You pretty much have the best. Students in the world yeah. gather together, and you could exchange experiences <laughs> and knowledge, and you know everything yeah. like that happened in their lives. I think it was really eye opening, actually, because like there you could find supposedly someone who everybody else would call a jock, mm-hmm. but then he would have really great background in like piano competition as well, or something like that. Mm-hmm. It was just like someone with some kind of background that would like just wow you. Right yeah, away. I was like, what? Mm-hmm. How can this combination be? In just one person. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So really well-rounded yeah. people. What would you say was the most interesting experience at Harvard for you? The most interesting experience, I think, it's just like you know, like meeting all these people and realizing that you can't really just just look at somebody and stereotype them. Yeah. That you can't just look at this guy and say, "Oh, he's he's probably this much intelligence or he's probably just a jock or he's probably just like a nerd yeah. because at Harvard, people surprise you all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the same with the real world. You know, you go out and meet people and you can't just assume that they're this type, this certain type of people un- until you really get to know them. Yeah, just like yeah. you said, you people probably think, oh, you're a jock, you must be stupid. Yeah. But no, that's but, not the case yeah, at all. You exactly. can't judge them by just what they do or what their abilities yeah. are. Um, now, let's backtrack a little bit. Mm-hmm. I want to know the day that you got that acceptance <laughs> letter. Because I'm sure you're, you're expecting your, accept, your acceptance yeah, yeah, letters yeah. from a bunch of schools. What was it like when you opened that envelope and said you were accepted to Harvard? Um, see, I, I think during my year, there was this thing called early, um, early admission. admission. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so I applied... For early admission at Harvard and Brown. And you got in! <laughs> no, no, so, so I was like, I was waiting for like letters from two schools, right? Uh-huh. So I was like, every day I would go to the mailbox at, at my high school and like wait to see if there's like a letter from somewhere. Mm-hmm. And then this one day, I remember it was like a letter from Harvard. But I think it was in like a really small envelope. So I was like, so so normally, you know, when, yeah. when you... When you see a small envelope you you immediately think that oh yeah i got rejected for for our listeners out there who who are younger you know who haven't had the experience of applying to colleges in the u.s when when you are expecting a letter Mm -hmm. letter of acceptance if it's a small envelope then you you think in your head you think that you're rejected (laughs) yeah but if it's a huge envelope then you're like oh i'm in because in that package you have a bunch of you know all the information that you need yeah school i think it was a small one or 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 not a big one but so i thought like oh my god (laughs) (laughs) you didn't get it yeah but then, then i opened it and it was like oh congratulations you got accepted to harvard i was like yes and like 
it felt like you got accepted to some kind of like superhero class. You yeah. know what I mean? And it was like, oh my god, I'm elite now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, and and you could say that Harvard is my backup school because you you because you, you, oh, you, you, you know so you, you got you got in early. So the rest of the school, you were like, oh whatever, like it, it's fine if I don't get into like yeah, Brown. So <laughs> I got into Harvard, and then I still applied to like you know U Penn, yeah. Stanford, and Columbia. And my classmates were like, "What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Go away!" And he's like, "Don't you know? Don't compete with us." I was like, "Yeah, oh, but I want to try." I mean, <laughs> Harvard is like everyone's dream school. It was my dream school. Yeah. But I mean, I I didn't even apply because I mm-hmm. sort of realized that one, it's really expensive. Two, I don't think I'm that smart. I don't oh, think I could. On. I don't even think I could get in. So I didn't even bother. And I love the West Side. I wanted to stay uh-huh. in California, so I didn't applied anywhere outside of California. So, of course, going to college is Mm -hmm. not going to be all, it's not going to all be about the academics. Yeah. You're going to have your social life. You're going to have your friends and your peers. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? How were your closest friends? Can you tell us a little bit about them? You know, actually, my closest friends were were Asian. (laughs) Like, we're international students and or or Asian American. Because I feel like we just had, you know, like, similar mindsets. Mm -hmm. Because, like, they would understand, you know, like all oh, like the family values and stuff like that. Or they would understand the idea of taking off shoes before going yeah, into the room. Yeah. You know? But no, like get little, that. little things like that. And yeah. I was just like, oh, okay. It, it's nice that I don't have to explain anything about this. And people just kind of accept it. So yeah, like like my closest friends were um they were from Hong Kong, they were from like um actually some some Thai scholars as well. Mm-hmm. Um some Asian Americans from both like the West side and the East side. And um, mostly my my non Asian friends were the ones in um, my a cappella group. Mm. I was a part of like a, uh, an a cappella group at Harvard called the Harvard Opportunes. Yeah, and that was actually like one of um, a big part of my life. It was really fun, actually. How yeah. was that? It was like you learned how to, I think not not just sing, but actually manage a lot of things because we had to like produce an album by ourselves. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had to like. Every time we had a concert, we had to wake up early to like go put up posters on the boards around the school. It was yeah. like a really fun experience. Yeah. yeah. Were you there for each other through tough times or did you even have any tough time? It wasn't like a personal tough time, but it was like more like a, an academic tough time in, mm-hmm. in terms of like actually choosing my major mm-hmm. in, in, in my freshman year because... um. I guess it's different there, you know, like for, for Thai people, you have to choose your major before yeah. you go into um, college. But but for, for us, I guess, I guess yeah. it's the same for I, you, right? I went yeah. in undecided, undeclared yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, people just go into college undecided of what yeah. they're going to study or major in. So I actually, at first I chose um, apply math, apply mathematics. And, I, and then I started taking some courses and I was just like, I started feeling lost because I was like, wait, this is not... This it's is not like, what you like. Yeah, it's like it's like too deep. Like all these equations that I don't think I'm ever gonna encounter in real life. You yeah. know what I mean? So I was at a loss of like, oh, then what exactly should I study? So mm-hmm. so so I turned to my friends, and actually most of them were were um, studying economics, mm-hmm. um, coincidentally. And I I started you know looking at the stuff they were learning, and then talked to them a little more, and then I got a little more um, interested in economics, and then in the end I decided to yeah major in economics as well. Yeah. You you talked about your freshman year. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Did you struggle with anything else during your freshman year? Um, not really. <laughs> it was a breeze adjusting to campus, right? It, yeah, yeah, it was a really nice campus, nice atmosphere. Yeah. Um, yeah, people were really supportive of each other. There were no... There was surprisingly like no pressure in, in terms of like, oh, you had to do well. You have to compete with others or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, because... I think you, when you went there, you just kind of accepted that yeah, everybody's smart. Yeah. <laughs> so no matter what grades you get, you're still a smart person. Yeah. Right? Did you like guys that. do like a um, the the way the grading system worked? Was it a curve? Yeah, it was a curve. Oh, that's hard. Yeah, that's tough because you're competing I got like against a sixty on a test. I it would be curved up to like an A. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like you're competing against the best of the best. Yeah, but then... But you've managed to get an A, <laughs> so that's good. It was fine, it was fine. And actually, one really good thing about Harvard is that they really encourage this thing called study groups. Mm-hmm. So normally in, in whatever class, people would organize study groups and they would like, you know, um, 
divide like responsibility mm-hmm. and say like, oh, you go and summarize this chapter, you summarize this chapter. So it makes studying a lot easier, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for those of you who are <coughs> in school, I think mm-hmm. that's a really good tip. Yeah. Um, is to have a study group so you share the work and then yeah. you help each other out. The work wouldn't be as stressful. Yeah. yeah with a study group. What about yeah. the professors? Did anyone leave a, an impression on you to to this day? You know, I don't remember his name, but <laughs> it's but okay. It's I been was, a long time ago. I was ago. really impressed by this professor who taught Chinese history, actually, because before that, I was someone who just hated history classes because mm-hmm. I always thought that history classes were all about like you know like memorizing dates and like what's happening yeah. and stuff like that. But this guy. Just because he was so passionate about Chinese history, like yeah. the way he talked about it in class, you could actually like feel his passion. Even though it was like subject I had absolutely no interest in at first, mm-hmm. but just just feeling his passion made me want to know more about that stuff as well. It's just like I think that's something that I really got from him. It's just like whatever you do, as long as you're really passionate about it, you will get people to look at you and become interested in what you're interested in as well. Yeah. Prop <laughs> That is such a good answer. It's it's so true. Yeah. It's so true. Um, and I think Thai people really emphasize on oh, do what gets paid the most, or yeah, you know, actually. like do do what if if you're gonna go to, into school, choose the major that will guarantee you a job. Yeah, that's what I don't like actually. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, like if if you choose something that you're passionate mm-hmm. about, then automatically you're gonna be good at it, mm-hmm. and The money thing will come later. You know, actually, um, when I got into Harvard, mm-hmm. there was this um, what is it called like guidebook at orientation they yeah. gave us, and I remember one sentence that was written in there. It says, "Follow your passion, not your calculation." That's mm. that's the sentence that like really struck me. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I did in college. I, I took courses that I never knew if they were going to be useful after it, but I just wanted to know about them, so I took them. Yeah. Like acting, Japanese, whatever. You took acting too. Yeah, I took acting. That's course. cool. Yeah, that's cool. It's really fun. Yeah. Now, last question about Harvard. <laughs> mm-hmm. What was the most valuable lesson you've learned while you were at Harvard? Oh, there were so many, <laughs> but I think if if I had to pick one, yeah, I think it's that you know, the learning could could happen any time in in life because when when you're at Harvard, people. Never stress that the learning is just gonna happen here, and yeah, if you didn't come here, then you're worthless or something like mm-hmm. that. No one ever said that. Mm-hmm. And what they emphasize more is that you know the learning could happen just wherever you're willing to learn. Like even after you graduate from Harvard, actually, especially after you graduate from Harvard, like don't cease the learning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in don't every day, don't cease the learning. Yeah. That's a great thing <laughs> to remember. Love it. All right. Now on a lighter note, mm-hmm. if anyone follows Peanut's Instagram, <laughs> oh yes, please follow Twitter, my Instagram. <laughs> you probably know what I'm about to talk about, <laughs> but if not, then you should go follow and go look at his Twitter and his. Instagram like right now because you're <laughs> gonna see what I'm talking about and it's hot, it's sizzling and it, no, it's not just sizzling and hot, it's burning. Okay, <laughs> okay, we all know you have a great face. You mean the sun in my Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> the sunshine. The sunshine that's coming from your ass. <laughs> I have to say it for the ladies out there. Dang, you're oh. You've you've been flaunting what you've got, <laughs> man. I'm not even kidding. Your six packs. I don't even know if it's six packs. It's, it's like it's, it's like twelve. It's like a twelve pack. <laughs> I don't even know. But it looks hard. Like I just want to like put like I just want to bring some laundry and go like. Up oh against your abs because it looks like you know one of those laundry like machines. No machine one's ever done that. You should then. try. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> can I? <laughs> But let's just talk about uh-huh. that. Seriously, goodness, your body has been banging. <laughs> Now, would you say that this is the best version of you, or do you think that you could improve more on on which part? Um. 
or you think this is it? Like this is the the goal body that I've always dreamt of. No, I think people can always get better. Yeah. I mean, not in not just physically, but in every aspect of life. So, so I mean, I think it still can be a better version of me. Yeah. But I am quite satisfied with what yeah. I have now. But I, <laughs> I, I, I think it can be better. Yeah. I, like, for example, I want to have like bigger legs. I always feel like my legs are too small oh. for, for like a, <laughs> for a guy. I guess. Yeah. Because I keep. Having girls come up to me and be like, "Oh my god, your legs are smaller than mine." <laughs> I'm like, no. no. I think they're jealous. They're like, "I want your legs," because <laughs> yeah. girls we like smaller. So legs. yeah, I, I I think it can still be better. Yeah. But you know, like this this thing about like you know getting physically fit. Mm-hmm. It actually came from my insecurity before. Really? Because yeah, in in college, like. <laughs> Whenever I liked someone, I would get rejected. <laughs> so, 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 so then, like, I started seeing like magazines, like you know, like Men's Health and yeah. stuff like that. So I was like, okay, yeah. So maybe like American people like this, this, this type of look. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started going to the gym and stuff like that. Yeah, yes. that's that's when it started, and then it became more serious when I started. You know, becoming a singer. So, yeah. so now it's sort of like part of my job. Yeah. yeah. And now you're on the cover of Men's Health. Oh yeah. And you should send yeah, yeah, yeah. you should send those girls a copy of your Men's Health. Like, bam! Look, look at what you're missing out. Like, girl, you could have had this, but yeah. <laughs> you pass on this. So <laughs> here you go. Yeah. How long did it take you to get to this point? Um, I started in college, and then, um, I think I became. I think like more active about like you know like exercising. Yeah. During like the last four or five years. Yeah. Yeah. It, this came from another insecurity when when I looked around and I felt like, you know, the other guys in the industry they're all like, one eighty centimeters tall <laughs> and yeah. I'm only like one seventy. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my god. And then I feel like you know my face isn't like as handsome as theirs. So I feel like, please. Okay, I need to find something that would make me. <laughs> A little, you know, like have a little more advantage over them yeah. <laughs> in some aspects. So I started training, and I was like, I, I told myself that okay, if I'm not as tall as they are, or if I'm not like as handsome as they are, I think at least I have to be more fit than they are. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so so that's what I did. Oh, yeah, it's now like, you have it all. <laughs> yeah. you have it all. I'm telling you, which one is harder between the process of actually getting in shape? Mm-hmm. Or having the discipline to do it. I think they're both hard. Actually, they're both yeah. hard. And getting started is hard because people lose patience really easily mm-hmm. because they, they they don't see the results as fast as they wanted to. In the beginning, it requires a lot of patience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then maintaining it requires a lot of discipline. Actually, yeah. yeah. What what what's your daily routine like? Or do you? What about your eating habits? Actually, you know, I I don't do like clean, clean diet food, and yeah. stuff. Like, I don't do any of that stuff. I, I still enjoy. I really enjoy eating, and I I think that's one of my biggest happiness in life. And yeah. I, I want to keep that. So I just exercise more to eat more. Yeah, <laughs> that's my motto too. <laughs> yeah. Exercise yeah, to eat I ex- more. I exercise more so I can eat more. But um, my my weekly routine is like just like. Three times in the gym and then maybe like two times like running outside. Yeah, yeah, because I see that you're a runner yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. You, got, like, you ran I run the marathon. marathons and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. What inspired you to do that? Have you always been a runner? No, actually, I was. I really sucked at sports <laughs> before. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you! Like you're like after you turn thirty. Oh, oops, can I say your age? After you turn a certain age, and you're like, I'm gonna become like Superman. You're starting doing all these things, but it's good because you're taking yeah. care of your body so that it stays with you for a I long really time. Suck the sports like in high school I would be like one of those kids that you know the coach would just oh just, just sit on the bench you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. or he would like allow me to play like like for five minutes before the game ended yeah, you know yeah. what I mean out when, of sympathy yeah out of sympathy <laughs> that, that didn't make me feel good you know so yeah I was one of those kids but then um when I came back to to Thailand mm-hmm. and I, I after I moved to um gym and Grammy um I had a trainer and he was like oh you want to try um running and I I I think that was when I started seeing people's Instagram photos and stuff like that. Like people started running, so I was like, "Hey, that looked interesting." And so I, so I want to try that. And mm-hmm. so I just went. And I, I remember my first one was like a mini marathon of like eleven or twelve kilometers, Dang. I think. Mm-hmm. And I never ran that long in my life, but. <laughs> On that day, I, I remember so clearly. Like I was, I was running at like six a.m. in the morning. Mm-hmm. I had like mu- my music in in my ears, 
And there was, the, there was this one moment that I was running and people were like running alongside me. And then I saw the sun rising. And then there's like this like violent sound like playing in my ear. And I was just like, oh my God, this is such a perfect moment in life. And, then, oh. and I, it was like, I, and I just felt that if I didn't come out running, I would never have, you know, experienced this. Mm-hmm. So I, I really liked that moment. And then there was this other moment that I liked more, which is um, when I, you know, entered the finish line. Mm-hmm. And then you sort of realize that you've overcome the old you at that moment. You know what I mean? Like you became like a new version of yourself. It's, yeah. it's, it's not completely it's new, it's, but, but it's like you've stepped beyond what you thought you could overcome. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, that's a great feeling. And I, I think that that feeling like it got spread into other things in life as well, not just running. Mm-hmm. Like I, I started viewing everything as like more possible than before. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. What would be the best advice that you could give to ah. someone who wants to get in shape? The best advice, I think, is to like set a mission for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from my own observation, whenever I had a mission to do, I would have like more drive towards it. Like whenever I had like a photo shoot coming up, mm-hmm. then I would go to the gym like madly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I didn't want to look bad in that photo shoot. Mm-hmm. I, I, I wanted to look good and or. When I had like a mini marathon coming, I knew that I had to be ready because I didn't want to just like, you know, fell apart <laughs> like yeah. in, in the middle of the course. So I think like setting a mission for yourself, telling yourself like, I'm going to do this by this deadline will really give you like more drive. If, you, if you're just like going in there and like, oh, I'm going to exercise, mm-hmm. I want to look better, but you have no deadline, you have no mission to do, then it's just, it's just kept going without like, I don't without know, like any a, goals yeah, without, without any, any goal, without, purpose, without like as the much willpower, yeah, the willpower, as much as motivation as. Because or else, then it's like when but when he goes, he's out, he's in the gym, he's like, he's like, you know, it's like you're you're in the gym, you're like, okay, I'm exercising, yeah, but you have no real goal yeah, for if, if what you're doing. If you have a mission, like by the end of four weeks, I have to be at this level, then then you know that like. Okay, in this week I have to accomplish this. Next week I have to accomplish this. You yeah. know, it will be like you will see the steps yeah. towards that goal. But, but keep in mind when you make your goals, make sure that they're feasible. Yeah, they're not reasonable. like <laughs> I'm gonna lose yeah. fifty pounds in a week. Yeah, not um, like no, oh, you're I'm not. gonna run a full marathon <laughs> by next week, even though I had no prior experience in running. That's that's yeah, that's yeah. that's stupid. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start making goals. I think that's a really good tip. Yeah. <laughs> Being the winner of a singing competition. Oh my god, that was so long ago. (laughs) Yeah. You, of course, will have... You have a lot of fans. Uh And from a... Like from a firsthand experience, I have seen how awesome your fans are. <laughs> um, for our listeners, um, like I said, I've known him for almost ten years, so mm-hmm. I've I've been around him. I've been around his fans, mm-hmm. and oh man, they like they cater to his every needs, and they they bring the best. Food. And it's not only that level, but you have one of the most supporting fans ever. Yeah, yeah, I've are, seen I've seen their supports actually, for you yeah, and yeah. they they're there for you. They're ready to support whatever projects you have coming right. out. And I've heard from a lot of your fans mm-hmm. that they like you not just because your voice, your looks, but they like who you are. They like right. your intelligence. They mm-hmm. like your mm-hmm. mindset. Mm-hmm. And I think that's such a great compliment. So mm-hmm. now let's let's talk a little bit about your okay. fans. Mm-hmm. If you could say anything to them right now, what would you say to them? I guess thank you is a must. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you know, like, I think for what I'm doing, like being a singer and being like a public figure, yeah. like everything I'm doing now, it wouldn't be possible without these people who are like supporting me and like always waiting for my new projects, mm-hmm. you know, because this is not something you can do alone. Yeah. yeah. Singing means nothing without an audience. Can you tell us more about your fans? How, what are they like? You know, like you said, they're really supportive, actually. Mm-hmm. And surprisingly, they would do things that are beyond my expectations. For example, like during New Year. I'm very bad at like, you know, like keeping in touch with people, keeping contact with like all the puyai. <laughs> what do you call that? In, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, so I, I don't usually go around and like, you know, um, say Happy New Year with like all those like Happy New Year gifts yeah, to like yeah. um, 
I guess, what do you call it? Like the, all the influential people yeah, in the industry. Yeah, I guess. But my fans would go around and did that in my names for me. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like, oh my God. It's like, they're just supporting me in what I'm not good at. Yeah. You know, they're, it's, it's almost like like a relationship, you know? <laughs> like yeah, it's like what you lack. <laughs> yeah, what you they, lack. They, they, they filled, they they filled, filled that up. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when I have like gigs or events um, mm-hmm. in the other provinces... Um, they would actually like stand far away. So people who don't normally get to see me could be in the front mm-hmm. and like close to me. And that, I, I think that's really cute. Yeah. It's really nice of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like every time they see that more people come to like me, that's that's what makes them happy. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like a family. Yeah. It's like they're, they've seen you grow over the years and to have more people mm-hmm. feel the way they feel about you. I yeah, think it's, yeah, it's yeah. almost fulfilling. Yeah. And not only are they good to you, I've seen the way you interact with them. You're also <laughs> very good with Am them. Am I? <laughs> yeah. I hope so. <laughs> you are or else they wouldn't still be here. <laughs> Is that a natural thing? Are you like a? Are no, you deep down like a gentle so like, and kind person, well, or is I, it I mean, like, I mean, or is I'm, it a I'm skill? I'm gentle and kind, but I, it's not natural for me to like. I'm a really private person, mm-hmm. and I, I I don't have many friends in life, and I, I don't really like to be in a setting with like like really crowded places. I don't like that. So mm-hmm. when I had to be in front of these people, it's it's somewhat against my nature a little bit. I had to like take time to to get used to it, but. But I think deep down, like, as long as you have good intention for them, mm-hmm. I think that they will feel that. And and then for me, like, I don't, I don't take care of them in the sense, like, I don't go out and, you know, have special meals with yeah, them. Yeah. Or, like, I don't contact them individually by email or, like, what I do is that I think, like, an, an economist, I think. <laughs> 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 because I feel like when they come to me, it's almost like they're investing in me. You know, Mm -hmm. but not like, well, yeah, partly like monetarily, you know, with with their money and stuff. But like, I think what's what's more than that is like they invest in me with their feelings. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I have to be like something that would like grow, you know, and and give off like profits, like emotional profits for them, you know, like emotional benefits from for them. And I think in order to do that, I have to like be better and better in, in what I'm doing. I think mm-hmm. that's the best way to like give back what they've invested in me. And I'm sure by listening day. to this podcast, they probably love you even more <laughs> for hearing that. But um, you've been with them for 10 years, mm-hmm. right? Of course, without th- throughout this, these 10 years, mm-hmm. you've probably grown. They've probably grown. Yeah. Um, people evolved. Mm-hmm. Have they changed throughout the years or are they the same? Well, I think we've both changed. And I, I mean, to be honest, um, some people who, who, who used to like follow me, when they, after a while, when they realized that I, I couldn't give them what they want, like some, some, some people wanted really like Attention. a lot more intimacy. Mm. And I, I, I couldn't do that because mm-hmm. that's just, yeah, I, I feel like that's beyond my job. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah for so, sure. Yeah, some people just, just left me. And I think that's fair enough, you know, mm-hmm. over, over the years, people just... You'll start to achieve some kind of balance between you and your fans, I, I guess. Yeah. And um, one thing that's changed for sure is that, you know, in, in the beginning, there would be a lot of comments, you know, both positive and negative. Yeah. And whenever there was like a neg- negative one, all my fans would just like get so stressed over it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Including me, I would get so stressed over over all those comments as well. But then yeah. af- after... It's been 10 years and like after all this time, then you started to realize that, you know, all those things don't really mean anything, you know. Exactly. You can just keep focusing on what's more important, like the constructive comments and all those things. Yeah. And then just leave all those destructive, (laughs) negative comments that don't help you advance in anything aside. And I think both me and my, my fans learned that over the years. Yeah. And you've become immune to it eventually. And like you said, you, you, Take all the positive comments yeah. and then ignore the ones who are useless <laughs> garbage. You sort of <laughs> developed some like filtering system for yeah. yourself, yeah, <laughs> which is good because <laughs> I think that's what you need in life. Not not just for my um, profession, actually. I think in any profession, mm-hmm. yeah. All right, our next section is called "What's Your Take On." 
Oh. Now I'm going to give Ooh. you three topics. <laughs> Ooh, this is fun. Y- yeah, I'm going to give you three topics that is kind of current right now and what people are sort of paying special attention uh-huh. to it right now. I'm going to give you three. Mm-hmm. You pick one to talk about okay. and tell me your take on it, okay? Right. So here are your three topics to choose from. The first one is on life coaching. <laughs> oh, that's That's a really hot topic right yes. now. <laughs> Second topic is on homeschooling. Okay. And the third one is on print is dead. Mm, I think I'm going to talk about Which life one? coach. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about that? Sure. Oh, hey, you're the guest. I'm fine with whatever. Oh, no, it's fun. It's fun. I mean, um, where should I start? I mean... First of all, I don't think it's it's wrong. I think yeah. I think a lot of life coaches have really good intention, and mm-hmm. like I gotta say, like I'm I'm actually a, a fan of like. Have you heard of TED Talks? Yeah, I see it as like life coaching in a way. You know what I mean? In the sense that you can pick what you want to listen to or the topics that you're interested in. Yeah. Um, and you can decide for yourself what to agree with or disagree with. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important. But with a lot of life coaches. Um, In the current event situation. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> what I don't agree with them mm-hmm. is that a lot of them seem to think that there's only like one type of formula for success in life. Yeah. When actually in reality, people want different things in life, mm-hmm. you know? And if you want different things in life, there's not going to be just one formula that that's applicable to like every single person. Exactly. You know what I mean? I've actually, I've gone into like, one of these sessions, like my actual introductory sessions. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> I had this life coach and she was telling about all like the process. And then she was giving examples of like her students of like, but the way she was giving examples, she was saying like, oh, look at this person who now has a 7 million bot contract with this agency. Mm-hmm. Or look at this guy who now has like a 50 million worth of like condo. I'm, I'm just like... Why do you need to like, you know, I'll give all these numbers. This is not the ultimate like goal in life. Like yeah. money shouldn't be the measurement the, of how successful main, yeah, you are. Yeah, the main the main message behind all this. I think like it's okay. Like I think it's okay for people to say, "Oh, I want to have a house on the hill, like a really nice house on the hill." If if that's your goal. Yeah. Then of course, a lot of money is going to be needed in mm-hmm. order to, to achieve that goal, but you don't you shouldn't have you know, like the money shouldn't come before that image of yeah. the kind of life that you want to have. Yeah, yeah. It, it shouldn't be something to lure yeah. you for so, for success. So I feel like, I know, I I think life coaching is good. But actually, you have to decide what your goals in life are first. What mm-hmm. you want in life. Because if you want different things in life, going into one life coach might not be as useful as going to meet like another life coach you know yeah. what I mean yeah it's almost it's I feel like it's almost <laughs> like you you having a trainer or a yeah. nutritionist for yeah, yourself yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of customized I mean I know this is gonna sound ridiculous but I've seen it on keeping up with the Kardashians <laughs> <laughs> yes I'm a, I watch I watch that show religiously <laughs> okay. I keep up with my Kardashians uh-huh. um and on one of the episodes the little brother Rob uh-huh. who has been depressed and he his life has been downhill like Mm -hmm. his life has been the complete opposite of his sisters Mm -hmm. and he sort of needed to get his life in place and Mm -hmm. they he hired a life coach Mm -hmm. but it's on a personal level it's 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 almost like a personal trainer yeah and the life coach goes with you everywhere and and he he lets you make decisions right on your own Mm -hmm. but he'll sort of guide you like hey like maybe that's keeping you off track from your goals mm, a little bit. Right, like right. he knows the goals and he knows what to like <laughs> kind of like slap him into yeah, shape yeah. a little bit. And I think I think that's healthy. Yeah, I think I think the thing is that it has to be personalized. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's really important because let's put it into picture. Like say if you want to eat fish, yeah. you have to go into the sea. But if you're someone who likes to eat like pork, then yeah. you got to go to the farm, you yeah. know, and you need different skills for that. You know, you need different life coaches for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you yourself have got to decide first what you want. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Welcome to our last section. 
for our first episode, and this、Yay. section is called "What If." What if? Yes, which will be hypothetical questions.、Mm-hmm. Well, one hypothetical question. I have a list here of a bunch of hypothetical questions. Okay. And I'm gonna choose one for you.、Mm-hmm. There are a lot of good questions here, but I think this one will suit you. And I and I am honestly curious on what you're gonna say. Okay. Okay. okay? <laughs> If you were elected the prime minister of Thailand, oh my god! <laughs> what would be the first law you implement, and why? Is this gonna get censored? <laughs> <laughs>、uh, what would be the first law I implement, and why? Yes. Oh wow. Um, it wouldn't be a law, I think, but the first thing I would tackle would be the educational system in Thailand.、Mm. Really, because I am. I'm so frustrated by that, <laughs> like, because、yeah. I I feel like Thai kids are taught to believe that there's only one right answer to each question all、mm-hmm. the time. And well, I I studied in Thai school before. We grew up with like、um, tests consisting of multiple choices, yeah, with only one right answer all the time. But when I went to the US, one thing that was like such a big difference was that most of the tests were、a、essays, written yeah, yeah, written exams where you had to voice your opinions. And give evidence to support your opinion, because and I think that's that's really important in in growing up, and especially like society nowadays with like so much information coming to you from all around you. Yeah, I think what you really need is like analytical skills and like the 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 ability to differentiate between what's what's believable and what's not, what's applicable, what's Good. What's bad? What's what's nice, or what needs to be thought a little more? You know、mm-hmm. what I mean? Like you need all these skills, not just be able to picking out. Oh, is there? Where's the right answer? Which one is that? You know,、mm-hmm. that's not always just one right answer. And I think the whole educational <laughs> system in Thailand needs to be like <laughs> needs to be revamped somehow. Yeah. Yeah. That would. That's the first thing I would do right away. So, if you want the educational system in Thailand to be changed, choose Pinatsakdakon <laughs> for your prime minister. Tomuka. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It was such a blast, and I feel like I've learned so. Many things from you, so thank you so much for being、thank、here with us today.、Me. Thank you. It was a Yay. great, great experience. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Thank you. 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 Binge listen to all of our shows and episodes at thestandard.co/podcast. The Standard Podcast. เปิดหูเปิดตาเปิดใจเปิดโลก